Monday, a young academic, a PhD in English literature, lecturer in a university, walked into the Dean's office and said, I resign, I'm finished, I'm out of here, I can't do it anymore. I resign my post. And the Dean was concerned, he said, well, what's, what's, what's the problem? And he just explained how he went into every, every lecture with deep passion, with the wisdom and wonder of, of the poets and the playwrights and the authors, and he shared that passion and left nothing of himself behind in that lecture. And then inevitably, end of you see your hands and they say, hey, hey Doc, what are we going to learn for the exams? What's, what do we need to know out of this? And he said, every time they asked that question, a little bit of me died until I, I just can't do it anymore. I, I give up. The Dean tried everything to talk him out of it. He used every, every bit of persuasion he could, every bit of logic. Finally, in, in frustration and, and, and sense of anger, he said, look, you walk out of here, that's it. I guarantee you won't get another job in another school anywhere. This is it. This is your best opportunity and you've got a lot, of, lot in front of you, a, lot, a long way to go. You walk out, you're finished. And the young guy says, I understand that. I understand. I've just got to go. And off he went. The Dean and the people around him, the crowds, if you like, around him in his life, family, friends, colleagues, maybe even some students, all, all shared how stupid he was, how, you know, how they were concerned about him and trying to convince him. And the words of, of, of the crowds around him were, you're doing the wrong thing. Go back and, and try harder. Put up with it. You know, you just got to endure whatever. They saw this as a way of success, of achievement, and he was turning his back on all the, all the right things. But still he wouldn't be moved. He stood his ground because something in him called out something deeper, something truer, something richer, and he had to follow that way. He began to see with a different way a new mind. It wasn't about success and achievement, it wasn't about career. It's about being authentic, honest to himself, sharing wisdom and love with people who needed it. Anyway, crowds, the crowds in our lives, the crowds invite us and pull us often against ourselves into ways and things that we may not do on our own. Look at those crowds in, in, in the Solomon's, Solomon Islands. Crowds who are burning buildings and protesting and demonstrating. Individuals may not do that by themselves, but as part of a crowd they have a greater courage and the sum of the parts is greater in a crowd. Or the crowds that descended on the Capitol building in Washington DC earlier this year, protesting that a that a, a former president had been denied the election result, robbed of the election, despite the evidence and the law courts and everything else. Violence and, and abuse and death threats and all the rest of it. People who were probably good people and would not consider doing any of that, left to their own devices. But as part of that crowd, revved up and psyched up, they became something else. The, the crowds in our lives are like that. Crowds have a different mind. The, they take us in a different direction. We might join them in agreement on something, but we're led further and deeper. And, and we're, we're supposed to conform to the crowd and the way things are. The status quo of the crowd. Otherwise, we're pushed and rejected away. And we don't like that. Christmas is coming and crowds are part of everything at Christmas. The crowds in shopping centres rushing around buying gifts and getting into that frenzy and, and driven by other people doing the same things and crowds on TV, on, on Facebook and social media encouraging us to do more. But the crowds of celebrations, of, of endings of years, of the year, of a difficult year, where there be food and drink and festivities that will kind of mask over the cracks, a false bonhomie and false joy, a superficial joy that makes believe everything's okay. 
and hides the conflicts and truth and reality. And we all go along with it. Or sometimes that, that alcohol and food and whatever else fuels the tensions that do lie within and they erupt. I see this in families at Christmas where they've broken apart and I've heard stories of, of deep pain and struggle in families as, 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 as the conflicts emerge and more and more drink and ends up in violence and fighting. Crowds in our lives drive us to do things and see things in particular ways. In Luke's story of Jesus this week, in the third week of Advent, as we move towards Christmas, we hear about the crowds coming to hear John the Baptist, this enigmatic, mysterious guy from the wilderness. People coming out of the towns and the cities to hear this guy, to listen to him, driven by some desperate need in the chaos of their lives and the, and the struggle of their lives. They come to hear this voice and they're met with these harsh judgmental words. You brood of vipers, you snakes, what are you coming for? What are you fleeing the coming wrath for? Where are you going? Where do you think you're going? What do you think you're doing? And he goes on, these, these harsh words, and I expect the crowds to just disappear and think, who is this guy? But they don't. People whose lives are crumbling and falling apart and desperate and needy hear these words and say, well, John, what do we do? And he says, look, if you've got two tunics, give one to someone who doesn't. The tunic was the undergarment that the people wore under their clothes. And... They had two. One was for everyday use, six days a week, and one was for the Sabbath day, for the religious day and rituals. And, and basically, John's saying, look, if you've got two, give one away to someone who doesn't have one. In effect, God doesn't much care about what you wear for religious rites and festivals. God's much more interested in a heart that's generous and sharing and that people have what they need. If you've got too much food, share it with people who don't have enough. And the tax collectors, more on the outcasts, so people who are shunned. Well, what do we do then? Well, don't rip people off. You, you, you claim tax, you take tax. Take what you're supposed to. You already work for the system that, that makes life hard. Take what you should, but don't rip people off. Don't take more than you ought to. Well, well what about us, says the, said the, say the soldiers? Don't use force in your position and brutality to... to take money from people, to, to, to shake them down. Don't, don't extort money from people using your force and power. Be satisfied with what you've got and generous with what you have. In all these things, John, this, this aesthetic, ascetic guy in the wilderness, doesn't invite people out into the wilderness to live differently in a different place. He basically says, go home to your life and live truly there. Live in a way that is authentic and real and true. And it's, it, he's talking about repentance, a turning around, a new mind, seeing with new eyes and living in a new way. Living in a new way. Go and live the life that you ought to live where you are. Holy ground is where you stand. Don't look for heaven or God somewhere else out there. Don't think the future will be the place of joy and hope and promise. Look for it now. God's reign is everywhere around you. Open your eyes, open your mind, see anew. Don't see with the eyes of the crowd. That will always see the wrong thing or will always see the exclusive thing, will always drive people away. See with new eyes and understand that God is where you are and, and that God wants the very best for you and for all people and invites you into a way of life of generosity, of sharing, of love for each other. You can live the life you're called to where you are. That's what you're supposed to do. And he goes on, they, they say, you're the Messiah. And he says, I'm not the Messiah. The one who comes is greater than me. And he'll baptise not with water like me, but with fire and the Spirit. And he talks about the, the winnowing floor, where, where the, the farmer separates the wheat from the chaff, the the, the, the leaves and stems from the grain. And the grain is set aside and the chaff goes into the fire. And the fire is used to cook the bread and the food. 
It's about separating. The, the, this, this story is filled with images of judgment, but for us, judgment is often seen as punishment, as condemnation. And too often it's been used that way in religious circles. But for John, judgment is about purification, about seeing the truth, about seeing into. And he's basically saying that this, this Jesus, this Christ, this God, will see deeply into you who you are and will seek to draw out the true, the authentic self that is in you to become richer and fuller and more fully who you are, who you're created to be. We'll strip away the impurities and cleanse you. That's what the baptism is. So instead of sticking with the crowd and keeping your head above the water, be drawn down under the waves in baptism. You feel like you're drowning and you're floating against the current and it's hard. And you'll come up and you'll find life. You'll see in a new way. That's what his baptism is about. And, and the judgment of God is about purification. In other parts, it talks about gold. Gold that is subjected to great temperatures, great heat. And, and the heat burns away the impurities, leaving a pure gold. And John says that's what God is on about. Purifying your life so that the, the animosities, the hatreds, the fears, the anxieties, the... The stuff in you that denies you being you can be stripped away and you can find life. And that's the invitation for God, to live life fully where we are in this presence of God with generosity and love. And that, that academic I, I talked about, his mother was really worried that he had a breakdown. And, and she asked a friend of his, Tony Campolo, who was a, from their church, he's a, a preacher and teacher, but he's also a, a lecturer in, in sociology and so understands something of, of the, the, the guy's struggles. So Tony makes a time, they go and they meet, and he looks around at this guy's unit and all the, the, the authors, the, the books, rich, and, and the guys shares the stories of passion, you know, his passion. And then they sit down and talk, and he tells him why he's left this role, this post, and Kempala says, I, I know what you mean. I, I know what you mean, I get it. But you're going to have to find a job, you're going to have to do What are you going to do? He says, oh, I've got a job, I'm a postman. And he goes, oh, okay, and well, you're probably the most educated and qualified postman, overqualified postman. You're just going to have to find a way to be the best postman you can be, I guess. And he says, oh, I'm a lousy postman. You know, all the others, you know, they get, we all get there and we set off for the day and they're always back by 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock. They get ready for the next day and then they go home. I never get back before 4.35 o'clock and sometimes later. Why is that? Well, you see, what I've discovered is on my route, on my mail route, there are people who are hurting. Parents worried about children, children worried about parents, families that are experiencing conflict or pain or people who are dealing with sicknesses or struggles in their work or whatever, struggles in their life. And, and I'll stop and talk to them and I can share the wisdom of the poets and the playwrights and the authors and the wisdom of literature. All the stuff that's in me, that passion, that stuff of love that I've grown, that, that's helped me. I share it with them. They invite me in for a coffee and I have a coffee and we talk a bit. And then I go to the next one and, and by the time I get home, I'm exhausted and can't sleep because I've had 20 coffees a day. But I feel, I feel like I've contributed something of myself, something of the wisdom and, and, and joy of, of, of what I know, and I've helped people. And Tony Campolo says he certainly did help people, and people were grateful. At the end of the year, they hired a hall and all got together and gave him a party to say thank you for his wisdom, his love, his time, his care. He found a way to be himself, truly himself, a new mind, a new life amongst people, where he was, using what he had in him for the sake of others. And that's what John invites us into. That's what Christmas is about, opening our eyes to, and opening our minds to see the Christ in everything and everywhere and to share that love with the world in which we live.